So we've recently interviewed a Canadian immigre to England, Jill Weber, and we've had an Englishman from Devon, Ian Markham, who's now a naturalised American and Episcopalian priest. And our guest today was born in Canada, even though his English accent would not be out of place in anywhere quintessentially English. Um, it's a great pleasure to be interviewing today the Reverend Sam Wells. Sam is the Vicar of St Martin in the Fields, London, a church which has an honourable history in social justice, concern for the homeless and as a centre for the arts. And Sam has served for many years as a parish priest in situations of social deprivation. But he's also a distinguished theologian with a reputation as one of the most respected exponents of the sermon in the Anglican Communion. So, Sam, welcome. It's uh, great to be with you. Thank you. Now, Sam, as this is a sort of oral history, firstly, could you tell us where and when you were born? Well, I was born in Chatham, Ontario, on the 24th of April, 1965. <clears throat> I guess the question is why, <clears throat> other than the biological explanation, which I'll leave to your imagination. But uh, my parents are, were two very different people whom um, the accidents or providence of history brought together. My father was a Church of England clergyman and the, his father and grandfather were Church of England clergymen, so I'm the fourth generation. <clears throat> Uh, he fought in the Second World War. <clears throat> he was the youngest of four children, two of whom died quite young. Uh, and he uh, met my mother in 1955 and married her shortly afterwards. And uh, he and my mother lost two children at birth. And uh, uh, in addition to having my sister, who's still alive, um, so there was a lot of tragedy in his life. Um, there was actually more tragedy in my mother's life. <clears throat> she um, was born in Berlin in 1930, the daughter of refugees from Ukraine, Stalin's Ukraine, uh, who had come to faith having been born Jews um, when they were uh, late teenagers and my maternal grandfather had been uh, had become a, a Baptist pastor. In fact, he escaped by jumping over the um, border <clears throat> in about 1920. And his, uh, whether she was a girlfriend or whether uh, how close they were is not clear, but she left legally um, a few years later and they had my uncle in 1928, my mother and her twin in 1930. And then of course they left Berlin in 1938 um, for obvious reasons and came under cover of darkness, a very dramatic story of how they came to the UK in um, 1938. And my mother worked as a nurse and <clears throat> she, uh, as I say, lost the two children and, um, then uh, developed cancer when I was five and uh, and then died when I was a teenager. So uh, there was a lot of loss and grief in her life and there was actually quite a lot of loss and grief uh, and obviously the experience of being a soldier in the Second World War in my father's life, uh, a lot of death. So that was one thing they had in common, although I don't think that was what drew them together. But um, so it, it, it's a when people don't understand me, I, I say, well, I don't really understand me because you don't know whether you're going to get my father's gentleness, understatedness, or my mother's ambition and drive. And I think I'm a kind of combination of those two, but it's, they're a strange thing to have a combination of. Thank you for um, opening up that a little. My immediate question is my... My maternal grandfather was Latvian, um, at 16, dispossessed and uh, ended up in the UK, so traumatised that uh, it wasn't until near the very near the end of his life that he would talk to family about anything. He was a, there was a whole side to my family that um, no one ever spoke of. That was his way of coping with the... Okay. Well, we were the same. My mother, my mother didn't talk about it very much. Right. Um, 
and uh, we we didn't tell anybody else until after she died about her personal history. Have you managed to trace back any connections to her family? Well, in 1984, I w happened to be in Chicago with a friend. Uh, I taken a year off after school, and we were traveling together. We met in Washington, and we traveled together to San Francisco. <clears throat> That's Washington, D.C. So we were in Chicago, uh, and I said to him, I, I need to tell you something you, you don't know, because we're going to meet some people tomorrow that I've never met before. Um, but I had an address for them in Chicago. They'd left Russia in 1981, I think, um, rather more, well, different circumstances in Brezhnev's Russia. Um, uh, and so we did meet them and they were living in a, a kind of a ghetto, I suppose you'd call it. It was a, it was a block of flats of uh, people, who, all of whom were Ukrainian uh, Jews. And <clears throat> um, in fact, I had an extraordinary experience a number of years later uh, when I was on the faculty council of the Ethics Centre at Duke University about 10 years ago when I found myself sitting at dinner with four, with the four of us, three other people, all of whose, all, all four of us, our grandparents were Ukrainian Jews. It was, and it was one of those things that's a coincidence where you think, I wonder if that really is a coincidence, because that's too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. There's something, there's a pattern here. Anyway, leaving that aside, um, we met my uh, second cousin, and his family and his uh, half brother and his family, all of whom had left Russia about the same time um, and or the Soviet Union as it was. Um, so we have had some connections that have uh, stemmed from that reunion. Uh, and it turned out that my great uncle had died in a gulag uh, and um, one of my great aunts had, had uh, been run over in Kiev, uh, and then there was my uh, my own grandmother, and then the uh, Vera, who was the um, great aunt that I met in Chicago. I mean, at, at the beginning here, you, you talked about how you uh, <clears throat> you might get different aspects of you as mixtures of your parents. Have you spotted any aspects of yourself that you've managed to trace back to those tentative connections? Well, in looks, when I met my second cousin um, in Chicago, I, I, he just looked like just like me. So, and he was about my age, and uh, it was quite uh, extraordinary because, um, you know, I, I didn't really know there was such a person as him. I knew about his father, but I didn't know about his father's family. So, um, I, I think, in terms of characteristics. Um, that's hard to say. I, I guess. I guess that was, in a sense, that was the challenge I was presented with, in um, on two occasions. I would say in my life, which uh, were only about four years apart. So um, four or five years apart. I can't remember. Um, about twenty years ago. So the first one was when I gave a publisher. I'm not going to say which publisher or which book, but I gave the publisher a chapter of, of a book. Um, and the publisher said, um, you know, did you write all that yourself? And I said, yeah, even the long words. Um, and the publisher said, well, I'd like you to write a book, um, you know, on a much bigger canvas. And I, and I said, but, you know, I would, <laughs> I can't do that. I mean, you know, I was at that time a vicar of a, of a congregation of about 15 people on a council estate. And I said, um, if I do that, I'm saying, I'm saying I'm sort of Mr. Ethics UK. Um, I can't do that. Um, and the publisher said, why just the UK? Um, and that was a that was a tr transformative conversation. Since, uh, and I sort of date back to that conversation, a sense that well, you know, I've written a lot of books since then. <laughs> so, so um, I'd written uh, some, 
uh, at that time, but it, but it had always been really a hobby before then. I think from then I've realized this was part of my life, whether I liked it or not. And I've been inspired by that conversation to try and have those kind of conversations with other people to, to help them realize what lay inside them. So I think that was a, that was a conversation that took me from, if you like, my father's world to my mother's world. Uh, and then the second one would have been when I was invited to, to go to Duke University, um, which was a similar, a similar invitation to go from being a, at the time I was a half time parish priest. My wife and I had both taken part time jobs in order to make time to have a family. Um, I had also done so in order to create a bit more time to write. So I was a 50% time uh, parish priest of a very nice uh, uh, parish, um, but not, you know, world renowned <coughs> or, or even um, nationally or even locally renowned, really. Um, and then asked to, you know, to, to go to w one of the dozen or so most visible pulpits in America. So, um, that was a similar moment where I suddenly, uh, if you like, skipped skipped a few stages. I was very lucky. I was never a, a lecturer or a assistant professor or a reader. I just went straight in at professor. Uh, uh, you know, it was a it was a massive change of life uh, and canvas, really. And so, in a sense, they were both. As I weighed those up, and they weren't just my decision, but uh, as I weighed those things up. Um, I, I, I guess you could see my mother's more ambitious side and my father's more uh, understated, gentle side uh, in competition, really. I would tease that out there a little bit with you. you. I mean, it sounds like you were pulled into positions that enabled you to become more of who you were as opposed to someone who sought any of those out. I mean, was, did you wrestle? Did you find yourself in those moments thinking, well, would, would my mother pursue this? Is, is that the way that worked for you, that dynamic with these opportunities? Was it an easy yes for you or was it a difficult yes for you to? Um, no, I, th I think it was a, um, it was easy in some ways. Um, in, in some ways, the second one was, was easier than the first because you know I think I've written 39 books now but when you've written a couple um you you know you I'm gonna I'm gonna write I'm gonna write I'm, I'm, I'm telling you I'm gonna write or you know it's all there's a lot of work ahead of you and there's a lot of thinking ahead of you and there's a lot of thoughts you haven't yet begun to think that lie ahead of you and so the idea that you would actually become known as a, as a theologian as you put it at the beginning as a writer whatever people want to call me, I, I don't really mind. But whatever that is, um, you know, I look back over 20 years on that conversation and say, well, um, that that was kind of what I was anticipating, but I, I still can't believe it's all happened somehow. So that was a bit more daunting. Whereas the Duke conversation, you know, I was sent the job description and the person specification at, at that stage, neither I nor they were taking this seriously as anything other than the complete left field wild card. But I read the person's specification and I just thought, well, that's me, isn't it? So uh, if that's really what they want, obviously I had to test out that's really what, because as you know, with interview processes, what people say they want and what they actually want is, is very seldom the same thing. So I had to tease out with them whether, you know, and I had several times had to say, and after the first conversation, I thought, well, that was nice, but no. Um, because I, I really wasn't at all sure they knew what they wanted or certainly what they wanted was me. But anyway, that became clear that it was. Uh, and, and I don't think any party changed their mind in the course of the next seven years. We were very happy together. <clears throat> um, so that was actually quite easy. Obviously, logistically, it was much, much harder because taking uh, a family and, and, and I said I wouldn't go unless they had a job for Joe that was something that she could really... Um, you know, spread her wings in, and and they did, to give them credit, uh, create a job which she did spread her wings in and did a fantastic job in. Um, 
and but two children and you know it, it's a palaver <laughs> and so and and also the kind of life that both of us anticipated having in the in the church of england and so on and and um but uh yeah so i i think um the, the, I, I, I hadn't, I'd have never really picked out before this conversation those two moments as particularly related to my parents, but um, there was a very poignant moment. I remember I could almost give it an exact date um, when I called my wife um, at about 10 o'clock in the morning, having looked at the readings for the, for the coming Sunday. It was, I think... Um, yeah, it was the uh, weekend after. Um, it was it was the you know it was a couple of days after we'd been to ha uh, to have no 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 that's wrong. It was that's right. I'd I'd been in the states uh, lecturing and and going to a, a conference. I came back. I looked at the reading and and I'd had conversations at Duke on, on the way back. And um, uh, I looked up Isaiah forty nine. Uh, it, it would, you know, it, it's it's too small a thing, uh, Israel, that I create you simply for, for Israel. I, I, I'm I'm giving you as a light to the nations, and I um, I read those words and I burst into tears, and uh, I called my wife and she said, and I said, you know, I've just been reading Isaiah 49. She said, so have I. Okay. Um, that was a very remarkable moment. Thank you for unpacking that a little. Because um, it's easy to look at your CV, um, you know, and just see this move that you make. And it was, you know, it feels like it was all meant to be. But it's it's wonderful to see how it, a little bit of how it came came to be. Yeah, no, I, I think it was it was completely out of the blue. I mean, it really, uh, as far as I was concerned. I mean, the part that wasn't out of the blue was... Uh, you know, the kind of theology I'd studied uh, at a PhD level and started to write about what, you know, Duke Divinity School was the kind of world HQ at the time for that kind of theology. So I'd be, that, that's why I'd been there to lecture a couple of times. And that, so in that sense, it wasn't coincidence. But I had, I had attended a service at Duke Chapel um, back in probably uh, the early, 2001, probably, just after 9-11. And, um, you know, it, it was a very different environment to the Church of England. So it, it didn't cross my mind that I would be preaching from that pulpit every couple of weeks uh, in only, only four years later. That, that, um, that just seemed like something. So I, I do, it's funny, when I think of um, my installation service at Duke at, in September 2005, I remember thinking, and it was a strange experience because we had no family there. You know, it, it's strange to have a life event where there's no, uh, uh, you know, I suppose our children were there, but but there was no wider family at all. And and um, it was a big life event. It was one of the biggest I'd had. And and there was no one to share it with, really, in, in a, in a set, in sense of people I'd known for a long time. Um, and I remember thinking my father would not have understood this. In fact, he would have thought it was ecclesiastically rather irregular because, you know, it wasn't really part of a denomination. It was just a sort of self-made interdenominational thing, not, and not really under anybody's authority other than the president of the university. I mean, I, I had the license of the Bishop of North Carolina, but he didn't have any formal relationship. Um, and I remember thinking my father wouldn't really have got this. Uh, but I think my mother would. It also reminds me uh, a few minutes ago, you evoked the Anglican Church, um, and it's certainly the it, the reach of the Anglican Church that helped facilitate this opportunity for you, didn't it? And it just reminds me again of how diverse and broad and networked the Anglican Church is, not just institutionally but relationally. Um, that you can get from where you were through being an Anglican priest to somewhere that you could never have imagined when you were there four years before that you'd it's quite exceptional isn't it well I think um I mean Duke you know Duke hasn't had any connection with the Anglican church although I suppose the divinity school does now because of the Anglican Episcopal house that my wife set up 
uh, back in 2005. But, um, but I think what um, what strikes me about that is, is, is I go back to uh, the age my children are now, which is you know when you're working out what your life is going to be, and um, at that age. Uh, before, during, after university, I, I, I thought initially I'd like to be a journalist because I, I knew I could write from quite an early age. Um, I, I thought about being a, an academic, uh, again, for the same sort of reason, just in a more uh, ordered way. Uh, obviously, I thought about being a pastor. Um, I didn't actually ever think seriously about running a significant sized organization. I had no real aspiration to do that. But I've ended, I've ended up doing all of those things uh, and, and broadcasting and, and a whole bunch else. Um, so it's not so much the Anglican Church. I think it's, it's more the sense of being a, you know, being a parson historically, etymologically comes from the word person in a sense that there isn't a, defining shape for what a parson should do uh, and I've ended up doing you know being an institutional leader and a broadcaster uh, and a pastor um, and a writer and just and an academic you know and, and and all of those things now you could say of course that's because I've done none of them properly but that's really for for others to judge um, but in a sense they're all within that uh, acorn of um, of a calling to ministry. Thank you again for, for mapping that out, the, uh, the range of those interests. And sorry, I'm, we're going to get to how you came to do certain things at certain times, but um, the next question for me and all of that, have you, have you enjoyed them all equally and how do they all work together for you? Um, gosh. I, I mean, I, I feel differently about all of them. Uh, so, for example, being a university teacher, you know, being a lecturer, being a professor, um, I, I, I enjoyed that. I did it for seven years. I never wanted to do it forever. Uh, I, I made a decision, or at least I came to a realization is better than make, saying I made a decision in 1996. And I can again remember exactly where I was um, at the time. And it was, it was just about just after I'd finished my PhD. Uh, and I realized I couldn't be a teacher and a writer and a pastor. Uh, you know, I couldn't do all three of those properly. I reckon I could do two. And when I realized I thought I could do two, I realized I, I, I had no particular desire to be a teacher. It just, that's what writers were. <laughs> you know, that was the other half of the job for all the writers that I knew. They were teachers as well, mostly university teachers. The idea of being a freelance writer with no, um, with no noun, if you like, for the, for the adjective to, to latch onto was 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 just beyond my imagination. It didn't mean I had, well. I, I'd thought about it, but I couldn't imagine doing it. Um, and I still look at people like that with awe. And of course, a lot of them actually are doing other things. They just don't tell you about that. Um, so having made that choice, it was, you know, in a sense, the, the, the priest, pastor, whichever you call it, um, has always been the noun. And the writing was something that came easily to me. I, I could do quite quickly. Um, I could get a lot of joy, joy and pleasure. Once I'd gone through that stage of the PhD and then feeling I had something to say, you know, which takes you a while, probably five years on from the PhD before I really got to that place. Uh, and then probably another five years before I could do that with a lot of confidence. Um, uh, that, that then, you know, in a sense, that's well, that was my hobby in the garage uh, until that crucial conversation I mentioned earlier. Um, now, it's still, I think, the, the part that comes most easily and I find most immediately pleasurable, um, especially if I get to choose you know, what I'm writing about, which I do usually. Um, it's the most creative thing I do. Um, I think you know, most 
most of my work, the, my theological work, has been constructive, creative. It hasn't been, um, you know, an account of one historical figure and their influence on the church of their day or, the, you know, that kind of thing, which you'd think of as a conventional scholarly thing to do. I haven't done much of that. A little bit, but not, not a great deal. Um, I've done a commentary on uh, one book of the Bible, for example. That's another conventional thing to do. But most most of my stuff has been, you know, constructive, speculative, I suppose. Um, you know, but being a priest or pastor, you know, pastoral care, leading worship, uh, these these these, you know, being with people at crucial moments in their lives. Um, they always thought they'd be single, and they're forty-two, and they feel drawn to to be with somebody else and they can't come to terms with it and they want to spend an hour and a half talking it through. I mean, there's nothing better really than that. Um, being with somebody as they face the death of their mother, you know, she's had Alzheimer's for 15 years, but but their actual death, they never thought would happen. And it, it's far worse than they could possibly have imagined. Those kind of moments, being the privilege of being invited into someone's soul at that, you know, that I, I still love that as much as I ever did. Um, so I, I would say those are the two. So the broadcasting, again, is a bit like the teaching. I actually really enjoy it, but I never thought I would do it. I mean, I do remember listening to Thought for the Day when I was about 11 years old and got my first radio and thinking, I could do that. And so, so to be doing it now is some, there's something quite satisfying or, or as Michael Owen used to say after scoring a hat-trick, it's quite pleasing. Uh, you know, it's it's nice to feel that I can do that and do it reasonably well, and people can appreciate it. Um, and that's it's a, it's it's a game. You know, it's it's a party game like anything else. You've got this much time, you've got two minutes forty five. It's a discipline. It's not preaching. It's not lecturing. It's something completely new. As long as you've got the humility to realize, I don't know how to do this, but I'm very happy to learn. Um, then it's great. It's great, and it's a it's a huge privilege to talk to five or six million people and so on. That's, um, I never- I Before I called to... today, I switched on Radio 4 and was pleased to catch the end of you, but just a little upset I've missed the beginning. <laughs> I was going to interview you today. And they said, thank you to Reverend Dr. Sam Wells. I'm speaking to Sam tomorrow. That's right, yeah. So, uh, and that's now in the UK, um, in America, I was at Duke end of no more introduction needed in the UK it's who we always hear on you know people feel they've invited me into their homes and that's what I'm best known for uh, somehow strangely even though I've only been doing it seven years or so um so it's a it's a, it's a lot yeah so the, the so the the and the institutional leadership is the hardest um because I don't think I'm a natural at that uh everything that I do with it is because I've learned to do it it's not it doesn't it's not an instinct the writing I feel I never learned to do it it just it just happened you know just I was born with that somehow but the institutional leadership is all learning by experience and uh, you know I never feeling that I'm doing it brilliantly um however you know and I became very aware of this in the states how how many uh, clergy and how many scholars ever learn those skills so where does a place like Duke Divinity School or St Martin the Fields get its leaders from you know these are these are jobs that require complex range of skills and and I, I thought well I've had I've had the experience of 20 more than 20 years of doing this now I feel I I ought to be I ought to do this it's sort of self-indulgent not to um but it's uh, that's that's the one that's work, I think, of all of them. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I consider myself a jobbing pastor, but for me, the academics, my PhD was fuel for pastoral ministry. So the the pastor in me delights in those little anecdotes that you offer. I I can't imagine doing theology away from the lived context of of people's lives. It's, it's yeah, I'm the same as you. They're like yeah. the stained glass window for the those beautiful reflections that you can make and the, yeah so that's, that's wonderful wonderful to hear and Sam if we just take a little step back because you you took us very quickly thankfully through, uh, what I say so wonderfully um, with your parents um, as this is a, say a kind of oral history if we could just take a little step back to your grandparents 
Is there anything in particular about them that you remember? Any other memories that you have of them? Uh, the characters that they were? Their disposition? I, I didn't know three of my grandparents. I mean, uh, what one died when I was two and two died before I was born. I only really remember my paternal grandmother who lived to the age of 100, uh, but who I wasn't especially close to. Um, my father, I fear, wasn't the favoured of the four children. And, um, it, 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 well, I saw her, you know, three, four times a year. It was never a, I never had a, what you might call a direct relationship with her uh, that wasn't mediated by six other people in the room. Um, but my, uh, the one I feel I know best is actually my maternal grandmother because she wrote a document, a kind of, biography of her husband which I read when I was 15 and then um, never forgot about but thought was lost um, but rediscovered the day after my father died. Um, my father had remarried and I went down obviously to spend some time with my stepmother and my sister after my father died and you know had a glance through a few drawers and were, there were some old handkerchiefs and socks that no one else was going to take so I thought I might as well have those and then I found this envelope which had this precious story um, and uh, a graduate student uh, kindly typed it up for me which was a wonderful you know sometimes people say if there's anything I can do after a bereavement or something and I said well if you mean it there is something you could do and so I've always been grateful to him for typing it up and um, it is the most incredible story. And uh, and my grandparents, you know, were both under five foot tall and I'm six foot, so I don't know where that came from. Um, but they were extraordinary people. I mean, they did something that I understand why my mother never talked about it until I read this story as a, as a grown up um, that following day. Uh, I didn't appreciate why she didn't, she didn't talk about it because my grandparents were Jewish converts who spent their life converting Jews to Christianity. Well, that's something we don't talk about. You know, that's, that's not something, I mean, it led them into extraordinary situations like converting Nazis to Christianity in the East End of London um, during the war when they were prisoners. You know, <laughs> extraordinary. I mean, that story, one day I've always thought if I ever have the courage to write a novel, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of turn that story into a novel because it's, it is like reading the Acts of the Apostles and that's no exaggeration. It is an extra, extraordinary story and it's, it's the most precious thing I have. So I, I think I feel close to, you know, I need hardly tell you that on many of the controversial issues of the day, I, sus I suspect my uh, mat maternal grandparents would have lined up on the most conservative end of the church and may not have been happy may not be happy with where i've uh found myself um but you know i was reading a document written 60 years ago so uh who knows how we've all changed over the last 60 years a wonderful fragment from your past trying to imagine you as a young 15 year old reading that and carrying that yeah. with you um so this Anglican lineage that you had, I think you said you fourth, are you the fourth yeah, generation? Yeah. So just tell us a bit about, about that. Was it inevitable that you become an Anglican? Well, I think of the, of the four, I'm the only one with ego. I mean, I, 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 you know, you're not usually the best judge of how much ego you have, but the others were very humble. You know, one, I think, was a public school housemaster who got married and then went into a parish uh, and... Um, my, my father was, I think, your, um, I, I was going to say underachiever, but that's, uh, you never know quite whether under, underachiever is a criticism of someone who had talent but didn't use it, or of a person, or, or a, a commiseration of someone who's, who had talent was never recognised. I think my father was more the latter. I think he, he had profound qualities which which simply weren't recognized in the church of his time. I mean, they were by his congregation, 
I think he was deeply loved, but he, you know, he stayed in the same parish for 30 odd years, apart from the year he spent in Canada when I was born. Uh, and then he went from there for the last few years to an even more um, obscure, you know, five villages on, uh, on uh, in the Mendips. Um, so he, um, but it, there was not a trace of resentment there. Um, he was a devoted parish priest to, to, to his bones. And, and I think that's, you know, that's in a sense what I've had to struggle against as it became clear that my life wasn't going to be like that. Um, whereas I'd got such a clear message from his life that that's what a godly life looked like. And so I guess at crucial moments like the ones that I've mentioned today, um, I was sort of saying to myself, well, do I not live a godly life then? because I'm not my father. And I, I think the, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a really personal uh, story that illustrates that. Um, Stanley Howass is a person that I've been close to and have written about first of all, and then with uh, several times. Um, and, you know, godparent to my son and, and we were very close we still are very close, but especially during the time we, we were colleagues at Duke. And the first time, the first and only time my father met Stanley was after I'd given a lecture at an event where Stanley was also lecturing in the year 2000, I think, uh, in London. And the lecture had gone down well, people seemed to like it. Uh, and there was a coffee break. And so I, I said, to I think I was sitting next to Stanley so I took him over to meet my father and said you know I really want you two to meet and my father didn't say pleased to meet you or didn't say <clears throat> it's a great honor or um he said the first thing he said was and it sounds rude but it, he didn't mean it rudely he said uh he doesn't get it from me you know it was his mother was the clever one uh and you know, he, in a sense, in that moment, he couldn't not see things through his own insecurity and underachievement. And as I say, it's not because he didn't have wisdom. And I mean, he had wisdom more than brains, I, I would say, but um, uh, he just felt small. So, you know, I, 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 you often see it because I follow sports a lot. You often see the famous sporting father who scored centuries for England at cricket or something and you think about their son going into the same profession you think how difficult because people always say well he's a bit like his father you know they can no, only ever talk about the father um you know i think of johnny bester who plays cricket for england now uh, and has probably played 70 odd test matches people still talk about his father who was a bit of an underachiever and he played about five times ringer but they still you can't get out from that um whereas for me it was the it kind of the other way around. It was not wanting to make my father feel small and realizing that I had a calling that was different from my father's. And that took me well into my thirties to, um, to realize, I think, you know, he, he would have found Duke really weird. He would have loved St. Martin in the fields because I think he would have thought that was everything that a church of England parish could possibly be. Um, but I think my academic side and writing he didn't really have a lot of time for that. He thought it was indulgence. I think it wasn't the real thing. Thank you for sharing that. Those personal anecdotes. Um, if I may just ask, leading us there, just with one last question: Is there something that you, other than observing, you ever got anywhere near in conversation with your father? That's a great question. Uh, nothing like as much as I would have liked. Um, we, we disagreed on some significant issues around sexuality, around war and peace, uh, to, to take two most obvious ones. Um, but if I think of the word with, which has obviously become an important word to me, if I think about the times I was most with my father, um, two, two occasions come to mind. One, when I had to tell him that his sister had died. I remember that was a very intimate moment. 
when I felt I was being the pastor, it was before I was ordained, but I felt I was being the pastor and he was being the, the person in need of care. Uh, Cause she did, you know, she wasn't particularly old. Um, and the other was, I remember saying morning prayer together, which we didn't do very often. But if my father was brilliant at one thing, it was reading the Bible out loud. Um, I wonder one of my first colleagues in ministry said, I, I would just like it if your father read the lesson every time because he reads it. And he did read, he read the Bible very well. And I remember him reading a passage that since then has always become what, one of the handful of most precious passages in the Bible for me. And that's the death of Absalom. Um, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, my son, would that I had died in, instead of you. It makes me tear up. Um, because because it's a, it's about a father and a son. So that's I, we didn't read that at his funeral, but um, hopefully I wasn't quite as wayward as Absalom. But um, but remembering that moment and how beautifully he read that lesson, how poignant it was. Yeah, that would be the moment that stood out. Thank you. Can you tell us a bit about your Let's turn back to your childhood and the environs that you grew up in. What are any memories of the places that you were growing up when you were a young boy that stand out for you when you recall? Well, I, I, I grew up in um, what was called itself a village. I don't know if it still does. Uh, it, was, it grew to about 5,000 people by the time I moved away. It's probably a bit bigger than that now. Between Bath and Bristol, and um, my strongest memories are of, of worship in the little church where my father was a rector. It was far too small a church. Um, and for, for the congregation size, which was a nice problem to have, I, I don't know if it still has that problem, but it, it, uh, it, it was a, a you know, medieval 12th century church uh, in, a, a, in a fairly healthy, thriving parish of 5,000 people so it just wasn't big enough and the last time I was there about six years ago it just felt tiny I mean I just couldn't believe you know as, as often things from your childhood that seemed big at the time feel absolutely tiny um I particularly remember outdoor worship you know so rogation was a big thing which it isn't in many parishes these days and harvest was a big thing uh, and there, there were times we would actually go out into the big churchyard where the, the, um, grave, the, the gravestones had been moved. Um, so I think, that, that, you know, those would be profound memories. And, and the view from that churchyard, I can, I can visualise it now, you know, clear as day. Um, so that sense of, and I think what I take from that is something about the depth of worship but trying to remix that in a new context. Um, so, um, I mean, these days people talk about worship being alive and relevant and those kind of things. Um, I don't think it really occurred to us in the 70s that worship needed to be relevant. It didn't occur to me. It was just something you did. Uh, the idea that it would be better if it was more relevant. or, But I, but I think that sense of let's mix this up and do it the other way around and let's do it outside. And, you know, that certainly stays with me. Um, I, I played a lot of football, you know, so I think at any moment that I could have a ball and put a couple of jackets on the ground and have a game of, you know, that was, that would be the second thing. And then I think the third thing probably would be uh, my mother being ill. You know, that was, that was a pretty much um, from, you know, from, from when I was five, from as, as long as I can remember, that was just part of our family's life and uh, and wasn't, um, it, again, it was, it, was, it was a given. It wasn't something that we questioned or assumed would ever change. It, it was just, it just, it just was. Um, it's not something to complain about or um, feel hard done by about it it just it just was a fact of life um 
So you're about four or five when you find out that your mother is seriously ill. Is that is that right, Sam? Yeah, when she was was first had her first of two two or three operations. Yeah, yeah. And and so if, I know, you know, as a pastor, and um, I'm a pastor, and you get to lean into those parts of people's lives in your in your parish. What? Well, how did your parents? connects you at that time and explain what was happening? I, I think I, I had a very strong sense that, that my sister was on the inside of things, being three years older, uh, and I wasn't. I think my sister and my mother were extremely close. My sister was, I think, uh, 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 an early developer, if you have that expression. And I think she reached a kind of maturity um, much quicker than most children do and and became my mother's best friend really from when she was about eight years old and my mother explained a lot of things to her that she didn't explain to me so i would then go to my sister for um you know a bit like having not been at the press conference you go and speak to the people that were so i would get secondhand information a lot of the time um uh, the i mean the the time that i particularly remember very vividly and have written about a bit it, it is the moment um about mm, best part of 10 years later not quite 10 years later when my mother did uh, sit me down and say you know i've been told i've got six months to live and um you know that's taught me a huge amount about a lot of things um one is that there isn't a nice way to get bad news um but and, and therefore, the, the more the more direct you can be, the better, provided you do it in a gentle tone of voice. Um, you know, she, she told me that the facts and, and I'm very grateful that she did, because, you know, the worst thing in that situation, if someone offers a euphemism and then you have to find out the facts like a detective for yourself. Um, as it turned out, she didn't die after six months. She spent three years dying, and the last six months were pretty agonizing, uh, particularly the last three or so. Um, so in some ways, it, it well, uh, that added to the confusion. I, th I think that meant that uh, I saw, um, that, well, by the time she died, it, I, I felt I couldn't actually take any more of it. Um, because I'd, I'd got myself emotionally ready for her to die quite a bit earlier and and stretching it out like that, particularly past the point where she was conscious, um, which probably was the last uh, week or so. I, I, I was actually out of the country at the time uh, and came back for the last week when she wasn't conscious, and that was um, that was really hard. Uh, she, she was at home. But um, so uh, I, 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 I think there was, there was still a sense of secrecy. Though there was, so there was these two big secrets. One was that my mother was from this Jewish refugee background and the other that um, she was dying. And so there were a lot of secrets. Uh, that's, that's a lot of secrets not to be telling people when people are asking questions. Um, and so there was a sort of relief after she died that I started telling people the truth about both of those things. Uh, and that, so that was, the, that was a, 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 um, a relief really. Um, but I think that the point of all of what I've been saying is that the, the biggest psychological effect was that she was dying rather than that she died. So that, that, that long period of time, three years intensely, but possibly 13 years, um more generally she was dying and and so that you know that's the that's the great memory of my childhood that was that my mother was weak fragile and dying um the fact that she died is a kind of a fact but it's not a feeling in the same way uh, you know there was 13 she died one day but she spent 13 years dying so it's it's that sense of of understanding terminal illness, understanding um, something that just isn't going to get better and, and, and you can't fix, you know, that, that, that's, that's the strongest feeling. 
Um, we interviewed uh, Francis Spufford recently and um, he talked about his uh, mother's debilitating illness and then his, uh, his sisters and the effect that had on him, the overwhelm of it. And one of the things he did was withdraw into books, um, which um, worked out well for him in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's one of those people that I I wasn't who actually trusted his ability to write and just went off and did it. Yeah. So, um, I mean, what what featured for you is I mean, other was it was it really you know was it lots of football uh, were books were books or was oh it? I think I think by the time it, I mean um, doing A levels was a was a great blessing to me because science and maths really were you know as a result of the fall. Um, they weren't in the original creation for me. Uh, the original creation was English and history and those sort of subjects. So to write a longer essay than was really needed uh, in the sixth form was the way I spent. So there were two, I grew up in a vicarage, you know, no heating, classic Victorian thing, bit far bigger than the family needed, but free, freezing cold. And there, were, there was a kitchen and there was a, a, a sitting room and then there was another room, which we called the drawing room, you know, in a very sort of Downton Abbey kind of way. Um, and nobody used the drawing room from one year to the next. So I took over that room when I was about 15 to be my writing room, my study, really. Um, and that that became, I mean, you know, if Francis talks about writing as, a, a, you know, his attic or wherever, that that was my place to hide my safe but nobody else came in there occasionally bring me a cup of tea or something um and yeah and i think that in a sense writing for me takes me back to that place even now 40 years later um it's the same experience i i i, I write best and i have the best experience of writing when i've got this little room away from everything um and Funny enough, actually, the experience during the pandemic, I have found a similar place to that. Um, you know, somehow cocooned from the, uh, I'm, I'm not able to be there all week, but I, but in the times I am able to be there, it ha it's a similar kind of refuge nest, if you like. Um, so, but I know that all goes back to that place, and it was a that was a place where I where I worked and where I felt most safe. I guess similar experience to Francis. So, uh, I mean, my chair behind me, in COVID in my study at home. It's, it's interesting you say, uh, you know, writing and uh, reading now it takes you back to that place. Um, I uh, used to read avidly as a child to escape domestic abuse and I, I still find myself sometimes when I'm curled up in a book having some you know those things that you feelings that you can't put into words they're just the atmosphere and the ambience around you um you know just that location uh, of, of what you were doing uh, then if you just picture that it's um, very beautiful thank you for sharing that so Sam um at what point did you decide to go to university and um, to study so obviously it wasn't going to be science no that's dismissed <laughs> uh, was it a foregone conclusion what you were going to do at university or did you have to agonize yeah no i think my father had been to corpus christi oxford uh my school celebrated the people that got into oxford and to some extent cambridge but it was really oxford that mattered uh, I don't know why that was. It was a geographical thing or where the head teacher had been himself or more. That's probably something as simple as that. Um, so for me, Oxford was what I wanted to do. Well, from the point at which I realized I was getting really good marks at things, uh, you know, not obviously at everything, but uh, at some things, um, I, I thought, well, you know, I'm getting really good marks at, at, in history. And I, I loved English. Uh, I never quite had the confidence to say English was my thing. I thought that was for clever people. Uh, and I didn't have the magic um, that I felt was needed. I also, I think, had a bit of a sense that the English course at Oxford was, you know, a bit Beowulf, a bit, a bit full of uh, um, 
Canterbury Tales and, uh, you know, stuff that I wasn't actually terribly interested in. Um, I was, you know, it was 19th century novels was what I was interested in um, and 19th century history. And uh, so I did very well. Yeah, I mean, I, I did. I got a I got a scholarship to the possibly the, the strongest college for history. Um, you know, it, things at that stage in my life. And of course it was a lot of it was displaced energy from uh, what we've been talking about, but I was doing very well and I did very well and got in, into Oxford. I didn't do as well when I got to Oxford because I didn't really work Oxford out for a whole bunch of reasons that I haven't ever really digested. Um, not for one to try, but um, the, so Oxford wasn't I, either socially or academically as uh, as good an experience for me as um, as uh, as I'd hoped, but I was uh, I, uh, partly because I was sort of weighed down by the privilege. I had a big poverty trip, still have possibly, <laughs> and uh, uh, felt guilty about the privilege that I experienced there and didn't find a way to use it well. Uh, anyhow, but but um, no, I mean I, I think I uh, from the culture I lived in you know, getting a scholarship to a, an art subject at Oxford was really as good as it got. And so that's what I aspired to do. And I was very fortunate to be able to do it. That was Merton College, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so Sam, in, the, in your late teens, through your A-levels and then into university at this stage, were there any people that were family, friends, mentors, um, anyone helping you through that time, inspiring you? Of, you know, outside of your family, or were you making your own way at this point? Well, that's another painful thing to talk about. Um, and I have written about this briefly in my book, Face to Face, um, but it's not something I've talked about a great deal. I don't mind talking about it now, particularly in view of what you've shared, but um, the most influential piece of person was probably Peter Ball, who, you know, was later imprisoned and recently died for um, not conducting himself appropriately in, in, in mentoring relationships. Uh, I, I, he didn't abuse me. Um, I, and I wasn't all, and I've, I've wrestled with to what extent I was aware of what else was going on and looking back. Um, I guess I was aware of some things, but, uh, you know, I was 18 and chose not to see them or wasn't, sharp enough to see them or to name them um but he he was a very influential person uh for me you know during that period around the uh, after my mother had died when i was in a sense living away from home on my own for the first time so um he possibly yeah i would say he was the most influential person and that of course that's that's got a very complex legacy now uh uh, which I share with, you know, the whole community of people who, as with all such communities, are rather divided about the people who feel furious, angry, hurt, and the people that feel, on the other hand, he was a better person than he's been portrayed as being, and people are not seeing the good part, you know, all those things that almost in invariably happen when there's a, 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 you know, a ghastly set of discoveries and disclosures. So uh but it was yeah I, I i lived with him i shared a bedroom with him for uh a period of time um but you know the, there wasn't any uh abuse um but but I, I i've greatly admired him and and respected him and he played a significant role in shaping my faith when i was in that sort of first year undergraduate sort of period yeah people are always complex characters it's interesting if i tell people the stories of my abuse from my childhood i know i can see in their eyes there the one dimensional aspect of how they then yeah. consider my mother but of course my mother was multi-dimensional and there could be yeah. love and richness and kindness above all those things it's it makes abusive relationships complicated to remember things you want to treasure but I know, I, sorry, I struggle with sometimes which bits can I treasure or should I treasure and which bits, oh. you know, are tainted by you know, the, the abusive nature of, of the person. Um, it's very difficult. 
Thank you, Sam. Now, Sam, you, um, you then move on to do a Bachelor of Divinity at Edinburgh University, which sort of suggests that you're thinking about becoming a priest at this point. But um, is, is that the case? I know. Yes, yeah, so we've missed uh, we've missed something out actually, which doesn't yeah. appear on the CV really. Which oh, is, okay. um, I I left Oxford and I went to Liverpool and worked with Neville Black, uh, who's still a person I'm close to. Um, in fact, I was just last week reading the uh, first three chapters of his memoir, um, and uh, what was significant about that long term was he introduced me to the notion of, I guess you'd call it adult education. I mean, learning without books, what, what uh, a whole different side of the brain when it, when it comes to formation, Christian formation and um, study and teaching and so on. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a working class part of Liverpool, a lot of unemployment in the 1980s, where Liverpool was in the news all the time for something or other. Uh, and usually difficult <laughs> and so that was a very formative year and I was very happy that year even though I was quite lonely I mean I didn't have a phone <laughs> you know it's, it's almost unthinkable human condition now um but uh you know having a social life when you're single and you don't have a phone is quite is quite a challenge and um but it was uh I felt yeah I, I but all the guilt that I built up at Oxford disappeared I felt I was living with you know kingdom people doing kingdom work and at Oxford I'd always felt that sort of sense of indulgence that I was learning about you know 12th century monasteries or something like that and what good was this to anybody whereas I could see the good of what I was doing and um, that was significant so yeah I actually went to a selection conference at the Christmas of my third year at Oxford so so the, the decision you know the the sense of calling to be ordained came during my year off just before my mother died and um and then that sense of doing it straight away rather than doing it when i was in my 30s or something came in the summer of my first year at oxford uh, i can remember both of those moments fairly clearly um both in the face of adversity, really, um, not not at happy moments, more at um, difficult moments, but um, but both brought a, a great sense of freedom, which I have never lost. I was to say, just to I interviewed Martin Percy recently, and something you just said uh, rings true from I heard in his interview. You know that the. the calling to ministry was actually catalyzed by some pretty catastrophic and life-changing events um i think people i think people may be surprised at how people end up in ministry um the journeys that they have to take to get there to establish their calling um and, I, and yours is certainly redolent of some very similar struggles yeah so at the point where you move off to Edinburgh, uh, did you have a, were you sort of well established with that sense of peace that you just mentioned? Um, was it a place that you felt at home at once you got there, in terms, especially in terms of studying in contrast to the, your time at Oxford? Oh, Edinburgh was a was a complete joy. I mean, I, I was ill for some of the time I was there, and that was difficult. But but really, it was three wonderful years, and uh, it it was a lot less stuffy than than the Oxbridge world, which I you know I needed to get away from. Um, I I was doing the subject it turned out I was best at, which was theology, which I'd never studied before. Uh, I I almost straight away found that I was getting great results and really enjoying it and all the things that didn't really happen at Oxford. So there was a tremendous sense of release about that. Um, I had great access to my teachers who were you know, very happy to make time to have an open evening, to have students round regularly, to talk over lunch and argue about BART and things like that. You know, that was very important. It was all within the context of a praying community on the other side of town, the Anglican College. Um, 
it was it was great and in the context of parish placements where you got you know you got a chance to, to try out a few ideas um in a humble way it was a, it was a really good experience for me and i felt i was learning a lot i felt i was enjoying myself making making a different kind of friend to the ones that i made at oxford i felt i had much more common there was a whole group of us who were about 25 26 who'd seen a bit of the world and yet had, had still quite a lot of playfulness left in us we had great parties remember one party in somebody's flat dancing so much that you could feel the floor was about to collapse I still remember that moment and and you know we had a great time and um uh yeah I I I I, I rediscovered something that I'd lost lost at Oxford which was a sort of intellectual curiosity and appetite um and energy so yeah so that was a moment i think when we were talking earlier about key moments i remember when my professor said you know you should be doing a phd and i i was shocked i thought going back to my father i suppose i was thinking well that means i'll lose my vocation i, I won't be a pastor i won't be a priest um i didn't occur to me i could do both you know i thought it was a one or the other and I and I was very dismissive of anything other than the course under which I thought I was going, and so I thought that would be sheer self indulgence and frittering life away to do a PhD. But I'm I'm very grateful to my first incumbent, who's still a close friend, who said, "Well, why not? You know, why not do it a day a week and see what happens?" So in the end, I wrote a PhD one day a week for three years, and you know, I had so much sort of enjoyment in it and took to it so easily that it it, it took me a very very short time to do a phd essentially we're, we're in different ecclesial worlds i'm in a low church charismatic environment where theological study until recently was as you would understand something to be suspicious of yeah i now spend a great deal of my time ironically having been in my denomination and tribe for 30 years now where, of course, the value of theological training is, is becoming apparent. Um, it's wonderful that, you know, something people used to pray for me against because they feared it would corrupt me. Yeah. They now come to me for advice on our church. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. But, but I, I do remember, I mean, from, I do remember I did my PhD part-time over eight years as a pastor, mostly in the early hours of the morning. And... And many times people would say to me, with the exigencies of pastoral ministry, you know, maybe you should, do, it's fine if you don't carry on with this. And I used to have to, I could see they never understood the look in their eyes when I said, you don't understand, it's this yeah. that keeps me going. Yeah. I used the word fuel, it was fuel for the, oh. for the contextual issues of, of, of what I was, was doing as a pastor. So, so you, I mean, so you immediately, it sounds like quite quickly, you move into your PhD whilst you're, you're a priest, you've got these two worlds opening up to you. Um, and could you tell me a little bit about what your PhD was on and did it intersect with, because I know you, your first placements as a priest were in some, some areas of great social deprivation, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, so, so uh, this was on Tyneside, uh, declining shipyard coal um engineering industries and but a, a, an anglo-catholic church which was at the time under very good leadership um a wonderful mixture of a little bit of charismatic renewal in an anglo-catholic setting it was pretty much perfect and in a, in a working class uh, both skilled and less skilled uh, but mostly skilled working class environment. So people with a lot of energy, a lot of initiative. And, you know, I, I love the Geordie culture, great sense of humour, just um, a lot of football, of course. Um, a lot of things that work really well for me and a uh, terrific colleague to work with and um, met my future wife at that time as well. So um, lots of uh lots of energy and um yeah so the phd was uh, well uh, it was really on stanley howard i mean it, nobody had done a phd at that time on stanley he was um 
I, I sort of think people are starting to do PhDs on me now and, and I'm sort of think how old was I and how old was he and so on. And um, anyway, so I, I'd been grateful, always to be grateful to Duncan Forrester, who was the professor who first introduced me both um, literally, but also through the books to, to Stanley's work. And as soon as I read it, I thought, hey, this is like, this is the best stuff I've been reading because this puts together the practical and the and the intellectual quest that I had and overcomes the um you know the 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 difficulties I'd had in faith and ministry up to that point so uh he you know he felt like he understood those and and named them and and resolved them to the extent they can ever be resolved so um the, the PhD was called how the church performs Jesus's story so you know clearly the four key words in that are church uh performs jesus and story and so it was really about those four words uh and it also uh had a sort of the sec that the last half of the last chapter was on improvisation and that ended up becoming a book that i in a sense made my name in in the american academy was the book it was the book that i wrote called improvisation which was actually my fourth book, but it was the um, uh, it was the leftovers of of of, of what I didn't what I, what I'd unearthed in the PhD. But as you'll know from having been through the process yourself, you you have to keep you 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 know you're you're like an impressionist who has to spend the first ninety percent of the show doing impressions of other people before you're allowed to sing your own song. So it was the sort of back end of the PhD. Yes, I'm just a few years post mine, and it's I'm in that stage of finally got used to realizing it's finished after going through my forties doing it. But then also, it's what stays with you. Yeah, you know, not not just in terms of your thesis, but the most formative notions. So for me, it's Martin Percy's the idea of the binocular and illustrative fragments. I mean, it's something I use again and again and again, and probably will for the rest of my life. For all of my yeah. thinking. So improv, yes, if I can ask you about the improvisation and where yeah. you, so in improvisation in the book, I think if I've got this right, you look at the, the drama of Christian ethics in terms of improv, uh, which is spontaneous comedy derived from pre-established practices, such as saying yes, rather than blocking what other performers are doing. How, how did you get to that from Stanley Hauervas? Um, well, because I read a book called Impro by Keith Johnston, which is an absolute classic if, for people who've done drama, been through, you know, 25 editions or something. Uh, and I read it, I still remember the night I read it. It was um, December 1992. And uh, I thought, this is, this is it. This is, this is what post-liberal or narrative ethics or what I now call ecclesial ethics is all about it's all here and nobody i'm pretty certain and of course i made sure uh has made this connection before and um, and so you know that's that's in a sense what a phd is it's putting two things together that nobody else has connected before and seeing the the fireworks that result and um that it, it, it was a dynamic idea it, it it i worked it into a book it took me quite a while four or five years to work out what genre because initially I used to do workshops with people and retreats with people and I thought about as a loose leaf file of work to exercise anyway I ended up with a an accessible academic book um which I've got no regrets about uh, I've never done all the other things with it um but I draw on that all the time it's become part of my sort of theological DNA, my imagination. And uh, it has been very influential. It's gone into a second edition. And certainly whenever I was in America, whenever I'm still in America, if people say, I've read your book. And, you know, with all humility, I sort of say, there's been one or two. Uh, do you mind me asking which one? I usually can guess. It's usually that one. Um, because... And the reason is because there are so many Christian liberal arts colleges in America where people arrive, or certainly did in the early 2000s, 
uh, in large numbers having come from quite conservative Christian backgrounds. And their professors are trying to help them find a way of reading the Bible and living their lives um, that uh, is what you might call more humane than a, a very conservative sense of the authority of scripture. So, and, that, and that's what the book gave people really. So, uh, but it also gave them a lot more because it gave them whole ways of thinking that are, in my view, and I obviously illustrated in the book at some length, um, profoundly faithful to the Christian tradition, but hadn't really been given a name before. So I, they weren't my names, they were Johnston's names, but I came up with four, four names for things that, um, you know, are, are, are still quite influential. I'm pleased to say. Wonderful. I, uh, it's funny you said that moment of reading a book. For me, it was things like reading Oliver O'Donovan and reading, you know, just, just how pregnant one phrase can be, recapitulating the Christ event. Hmm. And I just thought, for, again, for my charismatic low church tradition that has a habit of re-narrating through the laying on of hands and praying, and I thought, this, this is it. This is, this is what we do in worship at its best. Hmm. Our imaginations, we retell and we relive or invite each other to re-narrate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus through our moments of charismatic prayer. Um, yeah, I, I remember those those moments when you just, it's like the page lights up and something yeah. makes sense and you bring it back from one world into contact with another one. Um, can I take a step back about your your priest priestly life um, up in, um, you said Tyneside. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is a Geordie her grandparents were Geordies my oh. father's grandparents were Geordies I remember struggling to understand them with their false teeth and their Geordie accents when I was a child but it's, a, it's a beautiful accent if my wife spends too much time with her parents I don't understand a word she says when she comes home <laughs> but, and, um, but it would seem that and I think you've said in your your writing and doing our research for today that you your experiences at home that you've told us about and life lent themselves to some I would, I, sorry I will ascribe this to you some, some maturity and the ability to enter into the sufferings of other people's life as, as a priest did you did you find that in the situation that you were in I think that's exactly what I thought priesthood was I mean I, I think I I would still say nearly 30 years later that the most important part of being a priest is to is to be with people in the most difficult and unresolved parts of their lives and to be a person who can stay there and not run away or try to fix it and I think I always had that kind of instinct I didn't have the language I've just used for it but but I think that that um, core sense about what ministry is is what I felt called called into um, and yeah I mean it was a it it was something that people probably don't have today it was a congregation of 150 60 people on a sunday morning it it was liturgically shaped i was doing probably 40 plus funerals a year um you know there was a lot of pastoral care there was a lot of grief death uh, re re unemployment you know real stuff uh, with people who weren't used to someone sitting with them for half an hour or an hour and really wanting to hear how it was for them. So it was a, it was a great formation in ministry. Mm. One of my favourite quotes, I think it's Ruth Haley Barton, is can you walk all the way into your sadness and meet God there? Um, and the moment I heard that just a few years ago, it, it, for me as a pastor, that it is the greatest privilege to walk yeah, I have a slightly different phrase, uh, but it's obviously in the same ballpark. Um, I talk about going to the bottom of the pond with someone. If you know, if if you can sit with someone and go to the bottom of the pond, and then you know, see God's reflection at the bottom of the pond uh, that you couldn't see on the surface. So it, it's a similar, similar insight, I guess. I mean, sorry, I'm going to correlate some my research interests about the effects of consumerism corrosive behaviours on evangelical worship practices. But um, that 
ability to enter into suffering and frame it in terms of the spirituality of life and and formation is is unusual for for many people isn't it um to practice let alone have someone facilitate them entering into those moments and frame yeah them. we're probably skipping ahead in the story a bit but once i landed on the notion of being with in 2008 you know i i, I then had a language uh which i've spent the last 12 years amplifying really but uh, i then had a language for what I, i'd always thought it was really all about and um and in terms of a in a prophetic language in the face of contemporary obsessions um that that's pretty much the the long and short of it as far as i'm concerned thank you so um yes ask me how so improvisation uh, how did your thinking move on from from there what were some of the next steps that you made realizing well <laughs> i mean i always tell people there's there's uh, there's three books in a PhD. There's the introductory guide to the subject they've spent several years becoming expert in. There's the expert guide for the half dozen people who were as expert as they are and the one or two people who are more expert than they are by the time they finished it. And then there's the chapter they never wrote because they didn't have time. And and actually, that, that was pretty much what it was for me. Um, so the two big books that came after the basic publication of the PhD were Improvisation, which was the half chapter at the end, and then God's Companions, which was the chapter four that I never wrote. And that's the kind of how does all this work in church life? Um, and so God's Companions, in many ways, was my kind of favorite child book until I wrote Nazareth Manifesto. Um, and it, it, yeah, it, because it put really 15 years of reflection on ministry and 15 years of academic study together as as well as I knew how to with uh with an insight that um was a, a, I guess the the next big insight after the improvisation insight and that was that I got from John Melbank really which was it was a, a a recognition that ethics um ethics specifically but also faith in general was predicated on scarcity rather than abundance and and people often refer to Walter Brueggemann's work on abundance but uh, but it was John Milbank's work that um that really opened my eyes and uh, particularly an essay called can ethics be Christian in his book the word made strange and and uh, that was transformative personally and transformative intellectually and theologically and so God's Companions was the in a sense the big book the big the big statement and and in a sense that that and improvisation uh are, were the two you know were the two books I wrote eight or ten years on from the PhD that in a sense marked out my academic so for a, quite a while, around that period, 2002 to about 2006, I guess the sort of question of how worship forms character was my sort of niche in the academic world. And that's what I saw myself doing. In the end, I got a bit tired of that and went on and did other things. But, um, you know, if I'd been a proper academic, I would have spent the rest of my life in that area, but I've never been that kind of person. Um, so, yeah, so God's Companions was the next big book and then actually I didn't write another big book for um, nine years after that. I mean, I wrote a lot of other stuff, textbooks and uh, edited volumes and uh, collections of sermons and lots of other things. But um, it took another nine years before I had a, another big thesis, which was the, the being with thesis. Thank you. I just want to uh, dig a little, we're near the end of me digging into your work directly, but um, I want to quote something from you, from, uh, from your book, Improvisation. Uh, forming the right kinds of instincts is really about developing the imagination. And then elsewhere, you've put that more directly. Christian ethics is all won and lost in the imagination. And, and those are big, bold statements that I think a lot of people could intuitively grasp 
in terms of the performative image okay so it's story imagination and the performative um reading those quotes back to you i have in mind there i, I think it's stanley Harvas, isn't it the church doesn't have a social ethic it is a social ethic um is it that's i guess the question i want to ask you is, is the operational side of that so beyond the concept and the metaphor of improvisation and ethics how how does it get operationalized day to day for you is it like i said in my church i can imagine we we re-narrate and we tell stories and pray for one another where does the where does the performative for that christian ethic take place is it is it in work is it in the family is it in the liturgy does that question make sense sam yeah absolutely it makes sense i, I guess the moment that comes first of all to my mind was march 15th 2020 i remember starting the service we had a lot fewer people there than usual um and i remember starting the service by saying you know we come to church a lot of us have come to church for years and years and in a sense we were preparing for something and you know we never knew what that was but now we know this is what we were preparing for we were preparing for the pandemic um and anything that we're going to get right in the next, I think I said a rather short space of time, because we didn't realize how long it was going to go on, we're going to get right because of the preparation and the things we've learned to take for granted in what we've shared together. And that, that was community care, that was um, social outreach with disadvantaged and the people and asylum seekers, that was litur liturgy, um, that was uh, con contemplative prayer. That was that was all of the things that that we, um, you know. There's a there's a phrase that's very old fashioned now, um, but I still find it the simplest and shortest phrase. That the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Um, you know, and, and that's what I was describing was that once you're in the situation, it's too late. You panic. You, you, you know, you, you have you don't know where to go because you're facing the future. And so one of the most helpful phrase of all about improvisation is Johnson's phrase that the improviser is like a person walking backwards. What you what back what will you see backwards is everything that you've discarded that you didn't think you needed and everything that you've taken for granted that didn't you didn't realize that you knew. And, and those are more than enough for you. So that's where improvisation and God's companions come together. The thesis of God's, God's companions is God has given the church everything it needs. You know, the problem is we've got too much and we have develop resistances against the too much that God gives us. Not that we haven't got enough. The trouble is we're not looking in the right places. Improvisation is about taking that insight into what would otherwise be a crisis, but turns out not to be. Uh, so, you know, Chesley Sullenberger lands his plane on the Hudson River and doesn't regard himself as a hero because he practiced 150 times in his little module to do it. Well, that's what we were doing in all our worship prior to March the 15th, 2020, uh, when the roof fell in and it, and it turned out we knew what to do because we'd, we'd actually been practicing to do it. We just didn't realize that's what we were doing. Like the Thai football team who got caught down in that cave and the, the rescuers had been practicing every weekend. They had no idea what they were practicing for. Turned out these two guys from Wales were shipped out to Thailand and sorted out in no time. Um, because every weekend, that's what they've been doing. That had been their worship. That, that was their Sunday, if you like. Um, so, you know, that's the practical outworking of it. And do you think it always takes a crisis to precipitate that looking, looking backwards as we walk into the situation and it shouldn't do no i mean it shouldn't do but you know to take another well-known example uh you know maximilian colbe gave up his life because he spent years giving up his place in the food queue um to give up his life was just a continuation of what he'd been doing before he didn't realize it was a big thing um would you say that was a crisis well you know, being in a concentration camp in the Second World War sounds like a crisis to you and me, but it had become kind of normal by then uh, because lots of people were in that situation in Poland. Um, so uh, the, you know, um, Iris Murdoch 
go, go, she, you know, she, she says decisions of what we take when we tried everything else. You know, we, we, we have strong resistances to being in a crisis and, and we try and normalize things and use our standard procedures for as long as we can. Um, and that's why, you know, people like Sally Hawass have, have, have been on the side of ethics not being about making decisions because actually we, we don't make decisions. And when you asked me earlier in our conversation about crucial moments, why did I do this or why did I do that? You know, I wasn't, it's been very rare for me. I've, I've wanted to make a decision. You, you sort of feel after a period of time of thinking about something carefully, someone says, well, you, you kind of know, don't you? And you say, yeah, I kind of do really. But at what point you'd actually made a decision and, and often the, when you make a decision out of any context and you just put your finger in the air and just do it, it often turns out disastrously because it isn't organic in that kind of way. And I was just reflecting when you, when you um, talk, quoted those, those lines from improvisation about imagination, I think those take me all the way back to the very first essay of Stanley Howass's that I ever read in his book, Vision of Virtue. I think it's chapter two and it's called The Significance of Vision. It's about Iris Murdoch. And, you know, it makes me realize that those kind of things go very back to the beginning for him because that was his first book and they go back to the beginning for me. Now, you spent considerable time now as a parish priest in England. Um, you're extensively published, uh, respected as an innovative thinker. Um, and this is all before you go to America, um, which you've unpacked for us about how you went there. How did being in America change your self-understanding as a writer? Do you, do you feel you gave you more confidence? Did you get to try out lots of things with students? Were they incubators for work that you were doing? You, you mentioned you know, people just have to say uh, you're from Duke in America and that's all they need to say. Um, how much of that what, what got locked into you at that point uh, in that environment? Well, I think it pushed me to, you know, put my money where my mouth was in a sense. You know, so you're, you're in one of the most visible pulpits in America. What, what I mean by one of the most visible is that it became clear to me that, um, you know, more than a thousand people, there would be a thousand people there on a Sunday morning, but more than a thousand pastors on Monday morning would rewatch the video of what I'd said the previous day. You know, that's what I mean about being in a visible pulpit. And if you say something big, it'll be in the newspapers, you know, if it's about the Iraq war or something like that. So that, that's what I mean about being in a visible pulpit. People regard as authoritative what line you take either on the Iraq war or on the Beatitudes, you know, or on the interpretation of a parable or whatever it might be. Um, so, you know, you've jolly well got to do a good job. You've got, you've got research assistants, you've got staff, you've got, it's the most hierarchical institution I've ever worked in. You know, we think of the Americans being more loosey goosey, but, but actually, uh, Boy, you know, I remember moving the chairs on one occasion and one of my senior team saying, get back to your office. You're, you know, you, we don't pay you the big bucks to do this. And what they're really saying is we do pay you the big bucks to do something else that only you can do. So go ahead and do it and do it as the absolute best you can do it. And so to have a staff team, to have the whole institution set up, you know, you've got a research assistant, you've got a fantastic library 100 yards away. You've got amazing colleagues. You've got people who really listen to your sermons and you get 20 emails uh, on Monday morning, uh, you know, of thoughtful responses to what you've said on Sunday that all need replying to, you know, th the whole thing is set up for you to do a brilliant job preaching. You know, I, I, I love preaching prior, prior to that. I, I just hadn't been in places, and there aren't many in the UK, where the sermon is the be all and end all of an Anglican act of worship. And you might say, oh, well, that's what the evangelicals do. But the evangelicals don't do that. The evangelicals do Bible readings. The idea of a, of a sermon as a rhetorical performance, which is people coming face to face with God, not just through being guided through scripture, but through a, a, a direct encounter. Where does that happen? 
you know that that's not uh, that's not part of our culture in this country um but it is part of the culture in in significant places in the united states and duke was one of those significant places and so what you know what a fantastic opportunity <laughs> you know but it is a bit like being getting transferred to manchester united and being you know them saying okay you're only 19 but you're the center forwards you've got to score some goals it, you know so so okay i'm going to become very good at scoring goals <laughs> you know there's no point in just being good at football i've got to be good at scoring goals here I, this is a specialist skill i've got to get really good at it and a bit like i said about doing broadcasts earlier I thought, well, this is this is different. It looks like preaching. It looks like what, I, but this isn't the same. I've got you know just over twenty minutes. I've got a, a slab of time I've never been used to using before. I've got people with real intellect, you know, professors from other parts of the university, not necessarily theologians. Um, I've got what I, what I used to call the, the 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 longitude of the Ivy League and the latitude of the Bible Belt. You know, I've, I've got this unique combination of intellectual strength, but a very church-going culture. Um, I am going to read fifteen commentaries for every passage I preach on. You know, I, I am going to think. I am going to pull down some of those multi-volume systematic theologies and go into the details. I am going to do some research on people you know what freud said about this passage of uh of exodus or you know i am going to do some proper work on this so that everything i say is worthy of discussion you know the most satisfying were moments were the were when professors from other parts of the university told me they used my sermons in class like in an ethics class or something like that you know in other words i'm going to speak try and speak across the faith non-faith divide um, I realise that other people around the university are paying attention. Um, I'm one of the spokespeople for this institution. Um, and, and it's going to be worthy of sharing, but it's also going to be worthy of publication. It's something that could go straight into print the next day, and I would be quite happy to stand behind every word. So, you know, man up, to use an unfashionable expression. You know, be your own size, to use an American expression. You know, wear your own size um you've been appointed to this big job you jolly well do the best job you possibly can you know you've read the person's specification you say that you're exactly what they want we don't have to have any of that um imposter syndrome uh you know they've chosen you because they've seen in you you've seen in you what this can be just go and do it so i had a great time doing that you know rather than the classic anglican vicar who's a generalist and doesn't have to commit themselves to being particularly good at anything because they're so busy doing other things uh i had i had to you know I, I could teach i could write books um i could hang out on university committees i could do a whole bunch of other things all of which people wouldn't notice if i wasn't preaching well on sunday morning and i love that great how long did it take you to feel that you had your stride rhythm method well you, you felt like you knew what you were doing and you could you, i mean you use the metaphor of scoring it you're like you know i can score a goal more often than not i think you got to well i hope i retained a humility that said you start at the bottom of the hill every time you're you've got a blank screen or a blank sheet of paper to make notes on about you know you you, you each time you think i wonder i wonder what'll come this time but when it's come 40 or 50 times when it's come 100 times 150 times you're confident it's going to come it might have come straight away uh, you don't earn, ever earn the right for it to come straight away but you can be confident that it will eventually come if you if you i mean and, and that's part of it it's not just learning to write nice sentences or construct good arguments it's learning to trust the holy spirit actually to be up to something uh, and to trust your instincts you read the passage and you think you know that's always bothered me that thing about that passage uh and you think, okay, if it's bothering me, there's a very good chance it's bothering a significant portion of the congregation. The chances are, like me, they've never heard someone preach on that difficult thing. They've always gone for the easy part of the passage. So I'm going to preach about that difficult thing. I don't know what I think about this. But in three days' time, I am going to know what I think about it, and I'm going to tell a lot of people about it. Um, plus, you're working with a big team. You know, you're working with a choir of 100 people, um, with excellent clergy colleagues who will write prayers based on what, if you've shared the sermon with them, 
who will do introductory comments. In the end, we used to write Eucharistic prayers based on, you know, the whole thing works if you work as a team and you write the thing by the Tuesday at the latest. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I developed those kinds of deep listening to my soul, if that doesn't sound too pious. Deep listening to the Holy Spirit, I hope people would be happy for me to say. Uh, and trust, but trusting my reactions and say, you know, that's not right. Or that's not right this week, given what's just happened or what's happening in Iraq or, you know, what's happening in big time politics or terrorism or whatever. You know, you end up making responses to these things. So I, yeah, I, I think I held myself to very clear rules, but I, I actually, you know, this may sound self-indulgent, but if you said to me now, uh, Romans 8, that last part of Romans 8, when have you preached on that? I think I would say it was probably around June, July 2011, I remember preaching on that. You know, I mean, I think I can, I can locate passages, I can clo locate themes. I don't always get it right, but I've obviously I've got records of them and they're all on the, the video and the website at Duke. But I can usually remember, broadly speaking, oh, that was about November 2006. Yeah, I remember talking about that. I talked about Isaiah. It was Isaiah 40, I think. You know, I, I can I can go there because it took such a it's a bit like a, I guess, a an actor or a director saying, that was when I did Antigone. Uh that would have been the summer of 2001. It, you know, it, it feels like that, that each sermon was in a sense, it was a not a show, but it was a it was an orchestrated piece of work that had its theological and sort of sociological context mm. I, I know that may sound a bit grand but that's no I put a lot of my life into those yeah, sermons I'm trying to trying to locate the, the performative aspect of this the improvisational mm. so obviously week by week it, it's not like a, a West End production that you repeat the same story every week you have no true and stories but but you are it sounds like you 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 at some point you're deeply shaped with rhythms and habits and modes of thinking and intuition and listening and prayer that allows you to create and channel and produce these different narratives week by week but they and, and but also you you a develop a, a relationship with the congregation you work out what works people respond to things that went down better than others or and you you make sure you don't become a one trick pony and you you keep varying your style so he doesn't become predictable um but um then you uh you obviously you respond to context whether it's the sociology of what's happening in the community or the political context um or or, or, or the personal context i mean you, you know all of those go into the mix i i think i uh, yeah, and 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 you also develop your own voice. So, you know, the, I was I was still the English guy, even after seven years. And so, whether I said you or we about the election was a was always a choice. You know, when I, I remember doing a sermon on taxation on on uh, taxes to Caesar, did I talk about American culture, your culture? Very dangerous word. Our culture bit of a bit of a risk you know that always remained and so there were some things I could say and I I also remember doing a sermon um called Mexican Wave uh, about um uh well it, it was really a, it was it was a Advent 4 sermon but it it started with talking about the 1986 World Cup and I remember saying well I, I guess you probably wouldn't remember that I think I think USA didn't qualify that that year you know and you can have a bit of humor about something like that but it, you know it was about the origins of the mexican wave um but I, I i could i could say that in my first year or so but i couldn't by the end because i'd been there seven years my kids had spent most of their life in america i, I couldn't make a joke like that anymore it wasn't funny uh, but it was funny when i started so you know you you little subtle things like that change well I'll lean into the the you and we aspect of the influence of American culture and American Christianity on you. 
But just before I do that, I have a, another question in mind. Where, where there, when were there moments when you thought, gosh, I did that well, however well, whatever well for you looks like, whether that's provoking people or resonating with people? And were there, was there a time when you thought that was a big miss? And what did you learn from those moments? Well, funnily enough, it was the same time. The, the, the two were the same. Um, the most um, poignant moment, probably, uh, was nine months after I moved to America. Not nine months, actually, seven months. Um, there was a huge Ferrari on the campus. Uh, a lot of one of the sports teams were under investigation for an assault. Uh, it became a national news story. We had uh you know news media um coaches parked on the front lawn for six weeks uh it was even a st story that got coverage in the uk uh the sunday after it broke i didn't i i you know i i, I didn't do it in a rhetorical way but i i put aside the sermon i prepared i didn't go in the pulpit i stood on the chancel step and i said you know as a community, we've got some things we, we need to talk about here. Um, and I didn't use any notes. Uh, I'd obviously thought about carefully what I was going to say. Um, and it, it, I had an overwhelming sense it was the right thing to do. Um, two years later, I was cited in a case against the university. Um, for my behavior during that period of time. I mean, to cut a long story short, the players were exonerated. The complainant turned out to be um, untrustworthy, to say the least. The district attorney was struck off uh, because he should never have pursued the case. You know, it looked a very different story two years later. Um, and I've spent a lot of time mostly there, but since also wondering if I could have behaved differently. I still don't know, you know, because I, I responded as a pastor as best I knew in the circumstances. Uh, clearly, the players were innocent until proven guilty. Initially, it looked terrible. All the circumstantial evidence looked terrible, turned out to be false. Um, did I go with a rush to judgment, as it was known? Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm still not sure how to answer that. So, so, yes, I felt a tremendous sense I'd done the right thing, and it had landed perfectly. Um, later, not so sure. Not sure that it was wrong. Um, you know, just because someone's angry with you doesn't mean you've done the wrong thing. Um, but really, honestly, not sure. So, uh, but no, there were many occasions when that satisfaction you get from being entrusted with a key moment in a community where you get to speak to it. I remember a sermon I um, preached on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, I particularly felt that sense of uh, getting it right, both by addressing the issue head on, but also taking it theologically to a new place. Uh, and I can remember more spontaneous events after the Virginia Tech massacre, standing on the chapel steps with a microphone, responding to that, and, and one or two other tragedies, more than one or two, you know, probably about two a year, funerals of undergraduates, those kind of things, uh, where I felt I had got it right. Um, but yes, I also got it wrong. So Sam, we're, we're, nearly, we're turning the corner onto the, to the home straight for when you mm -hmm. back to the UK, but the, the question I teed up a, a moment ago uh, was, um, which you framed with, when, when you becomes we, um, how much did American life enrich your life and how much did American Christianity enrich yours? And then Dare I say, did you feel that there was any way that you as an Englishman fed back to enrich other people's lives? Um, I think 
Um, I'm a very different vicar of St. Martin the Fields than I would have been had I not been in America. In some ways, I when I came to St. Martin, I saw it as the most American, most recognizable church to an American of any Church of England church that I'd, I'd ever known. Um, and I guess that comes down to a simple word, ambition. You know, it, 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 in, uh, at Duke, we, we had money to spend more before the 2008 crash than after, but nonetheless, we had money to spend. Uh, we had resources. And when you had an idea, you had people around you said, so, yeah, let's put some real resources behind this idea. Um, and so I, I um, you know, I, I, so when I came back to St. Martin's, I said, well, why, why shouldn't we be the, the flagship broad church in the UK? Um, you know, social justice, all, this, all that sort of stuff. Um, what, why should we just be a regular congregation? We're in the most visible location, arguably, in the country. Why shouldn't we go for it? Nobody else is going to do it. We could be sitting around waiting for someone else to lead. You know, and that's where Heart Edge came from, really, is, is, um, is a sense that we can sit around for the renewal of the broad church, uh, you know, waiting for a train that's never going to come. Let's make the train and let's get in it and go. So that was something I learned in America, really. Uh, you know, it was, it was, again, going back to a theme we talked about earlier, it's what you take for granted. And, you know, in America, I, I learned not just to sort of dream up ideas, but to quickly think, how could we put legs on them? What other people need to be on board? Who needs to be, who might be a good board of directors? You know, you're suddenly creating an institution very, very quickly. Um, so that would be the first thing. Uh, I think um, the, the second thing would be, I, I just found fantastic colleagues. You know, I do have wonderful colleagues here at St. Martin's, but, you know, thinking about the calibre of the people who were at the Divinity School in those days, you know, Alan Davis, Richard Hayes, Greg Jones, Ray Barfield, uh, Sonny Hawass, um, you know, legends. Uh, and and uh, um, to have all of those as equals was just, um, you know, was incredible and uh, humbling. And, and I, I, do, I do feel that for some of that time, we were on a real high as a whole community that, that will be difficult to replicate um, for any of us, probably. Um, I think keeping it reasonably brief, I mean, lots of things about American culture I really loved and enjoyed um but uh the two things i would say that um you know on the other side of the coin as it were i remember profoundly thinking after i'd been there about six weeks you know the church in durham north carolina has everything that the church in the uk thinks it lacks numbers money and social influence but it turns out the kingdom of god isn't any closer you know and that was quite a poignant moment um which changed the way i thought about the church of england when i came back here you know because i i worry about some aspect of the church of england they, they still think that if we had more numbers money and social influence we'd somehow made it across the line um but so, so you know, in, in sense of being more kingdom focused, that the, the, you know, there's only one thing worse than not getting what you want, and that's getting it, as they, as they say. Um, or as Oscar Wilde said. Um, and the other thing I think was to, to to talk about something very dull, but certainly something I'd taken for granted is the the parish system. You know, I, I the Duke was a community of thirty six thousand people. Uh, big hospital, whatever, you know, the first principle of being a parish priest is you don't have to know everyone, but everyone has to know you. You know, you've, you've got to be present to people in all kinds and conditions of their lives. Um, and that's how I did my job at Duke. I, I'd like to think after a few years, everybody did know who I was. Um, and hopefully, and, and, and experience the chapel as a blessing to them. People of other faiths, people of no faith, regardless, you know, they, they obviously that's not going to be true of every single person, but 
that was how I approached the job, the way I would approach the job of a, of a, of a UK parish and, uh, or a Church of England parish. And that was a new concept because in America, you know, if you're a conservative congregation and a gay couple walk in the door, you say, um, I think you guys want to go along to the, the church up the road. In this country, in the best traditions of the Church of England, you may be conservative, but you say to the gay couple, oh, we haven't really done this before. Let's see how we get on. Uh, this might be rocky, but we'll all learn something from it. You know, that's that's the best of the Church of England for me. And that doesn't exist in America. <laughs> it's it's such a, a choosing culture that there's always a sense that, no, no, you, you know, it's not that we don't like you, but you'd be a better fit up the road. Um, so having to make a community out of who you really are, rather than, you know, wanting to hang out with people who just have the same life choices you have, there's, there's not many American communities like that. And, and I mean, you know, to, to comment on American politics, American politics reflects that. People just don't meet people whose politics are very different to their own. You know, they would go to a different university, they would work in a different part of town, they would pursue different careers. You know, it's all segmented like that. So how did, what, did anything precipitate your move back to the UK in 2012? Things run their course or was there an invitation back here? Or? I, uh, I mean, we originally said we'd go for seven to 10 years. So we, we never thought we were going to, you know, because if your kids get to a certain age, you know, they're into the system, they'll go to college, they'll maybe meet a life partner, they'll settle, they maybe have grandkids. You can't be living on a different continent to your grandkids, you know, or, or you, you, you look that far out and you think at what point is the threshold, you know, because, well, you can't be living on different, you can't be living, you, you can't be living in the same country as your grandkids, but, but have different nationalities. You know, we were going to need to become Americans if we were stayed much longer. You can't mess around with these things. You've got to decide. Um, and, you know, much as we loved our time there, and we really did, um, it, it didn't seriously occur to us that we were going to be there forever. Um, so then there was a question of what was the right moment. So I, I actually talked to the Archbishop at the time, Rowan Williams, and said, you know, if if I was to think of coming back, I was talking about me, just me personally at the time, what, um, what do you, you know, how can I best serve you? How can I best serve the kingdom and the church? And he said, um, well, you should try going to St. Martin's. Uh, they're looking for somebody. Um, I think you could do, I think you could do that really well. So that's how it happened really. So St. Martin in the Fields, um, in some of the other interviews that we've been doing, we've um, looked at Anglican social theology and some Christian socialists, um, Conrad Knoll, Stuart Hedlum, um, F.D. Morris. Now, I understand St. Martin in the Fields is very much associated with Canon Dick Shepherd, who I'm not familiar with. Could, is there <laughs> anything about um, Dick that you can tell us, Sam? Um, Dick, I think, uh, probably came to St. Martin's a little bit like I did coming from America. He came from a, a background where you didn't do things by halves. You know, so again, he, he saw St. Martin's, which, you know, was built by George I, had a long history of connection with the royal family and since the creation of Trafalgar Square in the 1850s or so had had a very prominent um, location in London, um, which it didn't have when it was built, but it really became so. Um, but it was, you know, it was undercooked for a long time, for the whole of the 19th century. It, it was just a, another of a dozen London society churches, really. And he he did, he transformed the place. He, you know, he he open the doors to people spending their last night in this country on their way from Charing Cross to the front 
in the First World War. And that, you know, that was radical, particularly as he closed his eyes to who they spent their last night with. I mean, it, it was really, um, it, you know, created this myth, really, of the church of the ever, ever open door, which is a great mission statement. And um, he also did the first ever uh, religious broadcast, you know, in the world. Um, and the first ever Christmas appeal, and we're just about to do the 94th one of those. So, you know, there, there were great traditions that he laid down. And, and actually, um, you know, I always say uh, that um, uh, in, in the UK, uh, everyone thinks St. Martin's is a homeless centre, but in America, everyone thinks it's an orchestra. So, you know, St. Martin's for a very long time has had these almost contradictory images in the, in the, in the world's eyes. And the people who've most successfully led the place have managed to keep these diverse, we would say today, or contradictory, as people might say, uh, projections and, and make them uh, real um, or real enough <laughs> and certainly inspiring. And uh, because in a sense, they're all true and they're all not quite true, like projections always are. Um, so, yeah, he, he created the myth of St. Martin's uh, by being larger, larger than life, by being very well connected to the royals and the upper classes. So when he got short of money, someone could write a big check. You know, it's what I call the benefactor system. You know, it, it's the old Church of England system that after the Second World War was replaced by the stewardship system, which is traditionally, historically a more nonconformist model. Uh, but here, the benefactor system ran up right up until the 1980s when it crashed. Uh, and so the commercial part of St. Martin's, which was became the alternative form of income in the 1980s and is now, um, you know, something that St. Martin's is a trailblazer of, obviously suffered greatly during the pandemic. Um, but that whole benefactor, you know, he was, if you like, the epitome of that always with the poor, but in fact, very well connected to the aristocracy. You know, that, that whole mass of contradictions, which is, uh, you know, which Conrad Noel and so on would represent as well. You know, it's, it, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful on a good day and incoherent on a bad day. Um, but um, it, it provided it doesn't get inflated with its own publicity, it's actually a wonderful thing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I want to lean in a bit here to the Nazareth Manifesto. Um, so talking about St. Martin in the Fields and its um, well-known work with the homeless, I know you've expressed reservations about doing things for people rather than being with them. Was, was that what you, was that, again, I use the word precipitating incident, was that something fermenting in you that turned into the Nazareth Manifesto or yeah, how did the Nazareth Manifesto come come about? So I think it came about. Um, it came it came about during my first year in America, two thousand and five six, and through two or three different channels. W one was re reflecting on my experience as a parish priest, where incarnational ministry was um, basic. Really, you know, you have your vicarage on the underclass housing estate, just like I did in Norwich for six years. Um, there's no question of you driving in from somewhere nicer because your kids want to go to a nicer school or something. Um, so that was better, no, it just wasn't the way it was done in America. Oh, okay, well, well, there are guns in some of these, <laughs> these places and I can understand why people might want to live there. Nonetheless, I, I reflect on that. Um, so that, that sort of being with was, uh, I realized was just, non-negotiable for Anglican clergy, but was not seen as necessary. So that was first thing. Second thing was a mixture of the response to Hurricane Katrina, where everyone jumped in minibuses and drove down to the Gulf Coast, 10 hour drive, started building houses in places where, you know, the elements had shown it was, it was pointless building houses and nobody asked them to. And a combination of seeing that and, and the pointlessness of it, and yet the energy of it, and the, the phenomenon of the American mission trip, 
where you go to Tanzania, you build a well, it's on the wrong side of town for local people, they never use it, you come back 10 years later, you're furious because no one's touched it. Actually, deep down, it was because your engineering students needed some ex uh, experience building wells, it was never about Tanzania. You know, and, 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 the, and seeing so much of that going on, not just in the religious life groups, but in all parts of the university, that assumption that we have all the assets and you're a basket case, and we need to transfer our assets to you, and then the world will be a better place. You know, so reflecting on the experience of being in America and then going back to my mother and, and realizing that, that actually, as a 16 year old, I had a choice in life. I could, you know, she had taught me to cook and wash clothes and things. And I could cook her a nice meal and work for her downstairs in the kitchen, or I could sit by her bedside as she was dying. And, you know, too often I'd chosen to make the meal she was never actually going to eat um, or eat much of. And I realized my, my own instincts were to work for when actually being with was what was required. So the combination of all of those things meant that I appointed a community minister to live in a poorer part of Durham, uh, and at her commissioning service and the commissioning service of her boss, who was the, I can't even remember his name, but it was a, it was a, it was a working with name and she was the being with person. Um, the commissioning service for both of them, I preached a sermon, which I think was called This Is About Nazareth, in which I talked about being with, working with and working for, for the first time. I hadn't landed on being for at that point. Uh, that came later. And, um, and two years after that, I was asked to do a, a lecture about community engagement for a church that had relocated from the centre of Durham to the suburbs. It was a Baptist church, Liberal Baptist church. And, that, and I called that address a Nazareth Manifesto, and that was the first time I outlined the whole shebang, really which then became a course for undergraduates in the public policy school, about 50 undergraduates a year for the next four years. And by the time I'd done that, I really had a book. You know, I, I really had pretty much, uh, oh, and that book actually then became a book that I published with a wonderful woman called Marsha Rowan, who I'm very fond of to this day, who set up a wonderful organization called the Religious Coalition for a Nonviolent Durham. And we wrote a book together called Living Without Enemies which was about her, how her she'd made a journey from working for, we've got to take the guns out of the hands of these people to her being with organizing vigils on the site of homicides in Durham. And, you know, Durham was a kind of city where it was Miami levels of, and Detroit levels of homicide. Um, and uh, yeah, so that book actually pre came before that was kind of the little book that came before the big book. It's usually easier to write the big book first and then write the little book. Um, but uh, uh, that time I wrote the little book first and then it was another four years before I found and the journey between the two books was really outlining what I call the eight dimensions of being with so when I, I talked about them briefly in 2011 but in the 2015 book which is the you know if you read one of my books that's the one to read sort of book um, I talk, I talk about eight dimensions of being with. So I really, it was a, it's a really rigorous analysis of the real texture of what it means to be with rather than just the more superficial things like presence and attention, which everybody understands very quickly. Mm, thank you. So, gosh, so much there. I wish we had time to unpack. Um, I want to move on to a recent article in the Church Times um, where I say... It seemed that you were envisaging some radical changes to the local church. I, I mean, you've already sketched out some dimensions of Anglican church life and how it has changed over time from patronage to stewardship systems. But if I understood the article rightly, you were suggesting that um, the local church might add on a charitable arm to put itself in the centre of local communities and, and even take on social services on behalf of communities um so firstly have i understood that rightly and if that was a thought experiment could you could you describe a bit more about what that means the possibility <laughs> well i don't remember the article i'll be perfectly honest but oh. um <laughs> but 
but what I imagine it relates to is a book that I published with two colleagues, Russ Rook and David Barclay in 2018, called For Good, The Church and the Future of Welfare. And, and what that book does is two main things. First of all, it goes back to the Beveridge Report of 1942, um, and it, uh, it recognizes that what Beveridge pointed out, his famous five evils, were all deficits ignorance, disease, squalor, so on. Um, and make a distinction between that and what we identified as five assets, relationship, creativity, joy, and so on. And basically the argument we were making was that the church is a very well placed to cultivate assets and the state is very well placed to um, address deficits. But what shouldn't happen is the church starts trying to get into the deficit business you know, it would be absurd if the church became a welfare provider, for example. Um, but the state isn't very good at actually cultivating assets. That needs to be done by local associations. Not necessarily churches, but churches are very well placed to be catalysts of that process. Uh, and then we outline in a later chapter five, uh, what you might call um, illustrative roles of the church in relation to uh, state social action. It got a nice review, actually. I saw the other day someone called it the most important book about social engagement for Christians in the last 20 years, which was really nice of him to say so. Um, I, I, I see it as actually the application of the being with principles that we were just talking about to the welfare state. Um, so we, you know, I've, I've taken this being with stuff into a number of places at which welfare was a, was was one of the more significant ones, and um, that I can't remember the article as I say, but it, it it sounds like it was about that kind of thing, and it um, to me it's it, it's if you want to see the kingdom at work, you, you've got to be showing up where the Holy Spirit is working. That, that, that's what it comes down to. Uh, and this, this, this same business, um, which I call delight in the Nazareth Manifesto book, uh, is, is about expressing joy and helping to unearth the abundant talents of people rather than being yet another person who highlights the one area of deficit. So, you know, the classic case in my experience is you, you call a whole, you look at a whole bunch of people in a big room or before the pandemic, they'd be in a big room. And you say that these are the homeless. In other words, you're defining people by the one deficit they share rather than the myriad abundant assets that they each have um, and that's just so many kinds of wrong that's another phrase I learned in America so many kinds of wrong um, and and so the book is a very simple short you know 120 page or something read read in an hour sort of book uh, saying what would what would the church's ideal role in society, given that it had such a significant role with the introduction of the welfare state and the beverage report in the first place, you know, we really need another beverage report. What should it say? And how should the church relate to a society that came out of it? Thank you. So, um, last three questions here, Sam. So, sitting behind your writing, there is, I mean, you may not consider it radical. I mean, I'm a Christian and you know, sometimes the things that we consider important, other people would call radical, but um, they're just bread and butter to a gospel life and a kingdom life. But they seem to be a radical attitude about the inner spiritual life and what it should be like. The Nazareth Manifesto ends, you, you say this, prayer is when we see God's wealth and God's poverty and bring to God our poverty and wealth and our neighbours too. Could you just unpack that, if you can remember that, writing that sentence? I do remember. It's a sentence dear to my heart. Thank you. Um, well, I think I talk about it there uh, in, 
earlier on that same page, I think that poverty is a mask we put on people to hide their true wealth and wealth is a mask we put on people to hide their true poverty. And that's making the same point about abundance and scarcity and assets and deficits that I was making a little while earlier. Um, to me, uh, this, may, this may seem uh, a rather trite example, but it's an example that has stayed with me from being about 12 years old. When I was about 12 years old, I used to like going on the dodgems at the fair and you would introduce a little chip into your dodgem car and you would join the national grid and then you would go whiz 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 around and bang into a lot of people and probably break their jaw um and it's probably banned now you probably can't do it for health and safety reasons which are probably quite right but a bit of a shame um but the point about that is not about the dodgem it's about the national grid prayer is the moment where you recognize there's a difference between two things the things that last forever which we could call essence, and the things that last for a limited time, which we call call existence. We, we think existence, you know, even in this conversation, technologically facilitated as it is, and therefore a miracle in some ways, we think existence is what it's all about. And essence is what Harold Wilson used to call just theology, you know, airy fairy stuff. But actually, if you look in the light of eternity, there might have been no existence, but there would always have been essence. And, and, and the, the word for what lasts forever in our common speech isn't essence because that's too technical. We call it God. God is what lasts forever. Christians understand what lasts forever as being personal. That, and that's, that's the amazing transformation, that what lasts forever is personal and wants to be in relationship with us. Now, prayer is the moment when we realize that existence, A, isn't all that there is, and B, isn't actually anything like as interesting as essence. And if we really want to, to be alive and to connect with reality, we, we need to connect with essence. And, you know, we often do it by closing our eyes because that, there are so many existence distractions. But that's what, that's what you're doing when you pray. You're, 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 doing, you're joining the national grid, as it were. You're joining the cosmic grid of what lasts forever and 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 all the the paltry considerations of your life your urges and desires your fears and anxieties fade away because they're just completely out narrated by the massively greater context uh, that is essence or, or god as you and i would call it um and then the second step in prayer is to recognize that 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 god is personal and wants to be in relationship and to try and open up all your pores as it were your your um, sense endings to be to respond to that relationship so those those are the two things that prayer fundamentally is um and you can do them obviously anytime um but as i say in in that end piece to a nazareth manifesto they they transform all your relationships and all your self-understanding mm. beautiful thank you if we could dwell as pastor to pastor, there is an old pub in my town centre that was um, derelict, shut down. Uh, my brother, as a former alcoholic, said it was one place even he wouldn't go to. Um, we, we had some prayer meetings in there that led to some crazy words from people about it being a lighthouse in the community. Anyway, people in our church responded, raised money. We preserved it as an asset in the community, which people seem to adore that it still looks like the old pub beautifully restored, but it's, uh, it's a community space that, that people use and some of the most vulnerable people in the community. And there is, there is it's interesting when a bank manager from Barclays, from the owner, uh, visited and he said, what's that? And I said to him, what? He said, I can feel something in here. And I said, what do you mean you can feel something? He said, it just feels wonderful. <laughs> And that sense of God's, you know, something that God is joined to and plugged into, um, you're just describing that, and it's helping me understand, you know, that that space and that place, uh, mm. a thin space through prayer and care um, of God's economy um, and how things are in, inverted. And it, it's become for us a miracle place. I'm, I'm not a, I know I'm a charismatic, Sam, but um, it's, it has sort of automatically become a place where the people that volunteer there 
and including some people that aren't Christians, they know that when they're short of things and give them away, people from the community just happen to turn up the same day and say, I had this, I had this pram in my car. <laughs> Is it any use to you? It's just, it's sort of naturally, naturally occurring with the essence in God's economy that people aren't having to make anything happen. It's just an environment. It's, I just, I love that sentence, the way you wrote it. It's so evocative and rich and you could spend a lifetime trying to uh, plumb its depths and live it. So I, the, uh, my book, Walk Humbly, is a sort of self-conscious effort to make every sentence like that. <laughs> so and that's where I talk mostly about essence and existence. So Wonderful. just a footnote. I haven't read that. I do have a very recent book by you, um, which I haven't even managed to crack open other than buying it. Um, small book. Um, it has all oh, the heart of it all, the Bible's big picture. Yes, beautiful little book. I'm, I'm trying to, in my denomination tribe, been talking about meta narratives and they, that sort of idea that, you know, there is a correct meta narrative that they should know. And it's like, no, it's about you owning your own meta narrative yeah. that you can carry around with you, the big story of God. And I've reached for your book and said, like, yeah, no, that's, that's what it's trying to do. So hopefully it's helpful. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm recommending your book and saying, that this is what Sam's trying to yeah. tell us. Thank you. Right, last couple of questions. Um, COVID is providing challenges to the church, that's for sure, and how it can be with people. Um, now, you're known for your practicality and your optimism, it would seem. Um, what positives do you see emerging through the innovations and the things that the church is having to reach for? So let me just just before you answer that question, I try to encourage other pastors in particular that I know in my tribe and who are trying to figure this all out. And I say there is this wonderful parallel processing exercise taking place around the world where people much smarter than you and I in the body of Christ are trying to figure out what it is to engage, if I use your language, to be with each other in these new opportunities and environments. Um, but, but what do you see taking place and emerging at the minute? That could be helpful in the long run? Well, uh, the phrase I use is a humbler church and a bigger God. So, um, and, and theologically, in some ways, it's, it's a slight realignment, which I, I imagine would possibly be music to your ears coming from your, your background, but the, the church has mostly thought of itself as Jesus, or as Michel Tosserto would put it, as a strategy. That's to say, we, we are basically the compendium of all the answers. And the rest of the world benefits to the extent that it becomes more like us. Whereas I think one of the things that has been catalyzed in this uh, pandemic period is that we've become more like a spirit church, or as Michel Deserto would say, more like a tactic church. That's to say, the spirit you know, as in Manly Hopkins' poem, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs, not his. Um, and where, whereas the, the Jesus Church is, uh, is Teresa of Avila, Christ has no body on earth but ours. Uh, ours are the limbs, ours are the hands, and so on. You know, the spirit church is rather different to the, the tactic church. It, it's, it's recognizing and celebrating all that, you know, clapping for the NHS that sense that there was real goodness and real beauty in the gestures being made and the kindnesses being offered by strangers as well as friends. Um, and if the church can be humbler and say, you know, the spirit can work well, perfectly well beyond us. And our, most of our job is catching up with where the spirit is making Christ known. Um, you know, so that, that would be the first thing to say that that's a humbler church, but it's a bigger God. Uh, and we, you know, there are some very practical things that are really tough at the moment. Um, connecting with children and young people uh, is is a bit of a wasteland for the church in lockdown. Um, and, um, you know, actually being community is is a real challenge. So... You know, one of the first lessons I learned in ministry, it's not, 
I haven't got a biblical text to, to back it up. It, it's just go where the energy is. And at the moment, you know, the energy isn't in desperately trying to replicate normal church online. You know, that is really hard. Strive to be what only you can be. Don't strive to be a bad version of somebody else or something else. That's, you know, that's my motto. And, and what can only we be? Well, what have people got? They've got time, particularly older people who are shielding have got a lot of time. Um, they've, they do have, in many cases, what we're experiencing now, the ability to connect with each other across geographical location and while keeping safe from the virus. So we can actually do some things that we wouldn't normally do. What would those things be? Well, just to take two examples from the life of St. Martin's, one would be we can recognize that this period triggers some profound anxieties and griefs for a lot of people and fears about their own health. But unresolved grief, you know, if, if, uh, if you talk to a professional therapist after a couple of drinks, They'll say, it, it, it's all grief, Sam, actually. You know, that's all it is, really. It's all grief. So if that's what people with zillions of hours of experience are telling us, it's all grief, really. Why don't we create a group like this where people in the safety of their own homes can share with one another their different experiences of grief? And it, it's not necessarily just the death of a loved one in early life. Grief can mean other things, too. And it can mean facing their own death. Why don't we, you know, that's something we would never give ourselves permission to do. It's a bit personal. It's a bit uncomfortable. We've got the time to do it. We're actually thinking about it all the time. Let's do it. Let's go deeper than we've ever been in a house group before. Because people will share honestly in the comfort of their homes. It's amazing how honest people are in this genre. Because they're in familiar surroundings. They're not in some cold church hall. Who wants to share in a cold church hall? Um, and then the second and related thing is we've had a lot of success with what we call our being with inquirers groups at St. Martin's. We just started them at the beginning of the year. They went online almost straight away. Uh, we're running about seven groups at the moment uh, and then another 10 or so around the country. Um, we're still in the sort of development, knocking off the corner stage. But again, the same insights. We, we've tried to create a course that is completely true to the being with insights and principles, a truly incarnational asset-based course, uh, one in which the, the fundamental conviction is that the Holy Spirit's been working all the way through your life. And the job of the course is to help you perceive what the Holy Spirit was doing with it before you realized it. So it takes people's own experience very, very seriously. Um, and Again, comfort of people's own homes. People share extraordinarily deeply. If you really stay with the silence and, and prove to them that you really want to hear what their experience really has been. But they're asking the deepest questions tucked away at home, you know, with no job or with, you know, no social life. Uh, so it's about creating an environment where the energy that they're bringing can surface. So, yeah, there are some, th some things that are really rubbish at the moment. Uh, and you can't do well, and you're very frustrated. But rather than mope over those things or try and replicate them badly, do the things that you can do that you never had time or thought of doing before. Uh, and there is a lot. There, there is a lot of those things right now, and it's it's a period that's going to last longer than we expected. You know, it, it could it looks beginning to look like there's going to be the worst is still to come. You know, this is going to get harder, and the hardest part of the pandemic lies ahead of us. So let's let's get used to these things because they're going to stand us in good stead for a good while yet, yeah? and and maybe they'll change our practice when we come out the other side of this. Well, for an anecdote, my wife is a, a minister with me. She has a theology degree, and we were had a meeting with our we call them home groups, small groups, about twenty of them, and had you know a meeting on Zoom, and you you try to think how do you personalise this for engagement and being with each other and. I was going to hit Amazon and, you know, send them a bottle of wine and some chocolates to bring to the meeting. But my wife had the idea of praying for them, writing personal notes, buying the wine and the chocolate for them and spending two days driving around hand delivering it to their homes. Um, and I just, it was a little window for me in the busyness of London life 
of the extravagant investment of you know a way to be with people or show love to them um I, I was quite staggered at the response from people from from that act um and and I'm just I'm hearing you thinking yes what are the things that we what are the opportunities that present to us you know to be creative uh with our deepest in Again, I'm bringing some things together from listening to you, Sam, you know, to look. I loved today that idea of walking backwards, you know, to I will take that away from today as a pastor to, to turn around and look back um, mm. at who we are, where we're from, what we know that we can bring with us instinctively into this environment. It's um, beautiful. Last question after you've moved me to tears. Even with COVID, we have got this time when career and post-career usefulness expands. Um, we've got improvements in medicine for the extension of people's lives. <laughs> so probably a slightly cheeky question here. What are you looking forward to if God affords you a long life and career? You, you maybe have many decades ahead of you. What, do, what does someone like you do, Sam, next? Oh, um, or is it? Do you have a modus operandi now? It's it's whatever gets put before you, and you know you reach with the ambition of your mother for as it arises. Or well, a long time ago, and I say long time, twenty years at least, I I came up with a kind of a formula, which has, stays with me. Um, there's there's three kinds of jobs you can do. Um, you can do the something of something. So, you know, you're the vice chancellor of Southampton University or the archdeacon of Bedfordshire or something like that. Um, you can be in whatever strategic place it takes to achieve the change in the world that you want to see. Uh, and so the job title and and if you're good at it, you become known for your name, not for your job title. Um, or you can just be in a good enough place to be doing kingdom stuff with kingdom people. And they all have flaws. The, the flaw in the first one is uh, you get this big job and you have no idea what to do with it because you spent your life wanting to get the big job. And, and you're lost in the role, you, you know, you're just a functionary, basically, you're keep you're keeping that you're a hamster keeping the wheel guy. Um, but sometimes you, you know, you polish your medals, and you feel good about people giving you a posh title or something. Um, and the money sometimes okay. Uh, the second one is, you know, there's always that danger of trying to make remake the world in an image of yourself you know there's a wonderful line in tom um tom holland's book dominion about a hindu who described uh uh westerners as people who or no christians as people who go into all parts of the world trying to re remake people to become like themselves you know and 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 <laughs> It's it's kind of funny, but it's it's kind of painful because there's some truth in it. And and the and the weakness of the third one is um, you never seize an opportunity and really run with it. That you you just enjoy being in the mix. You never know when it's time to leave the party, kind of thing. Um, and I think I've done each of those jobs at different times of my um, ministry. Um, I think I find the second type hard, hard work. Um, but there's a bit of that in my current job. I do feel a sense of responsibility to the, to the church at large, not just to my own congregation. Um, I've done the first job. It's a, it, 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 certainly my last job was like that. It was a posh big job and everybody knew who you were. Um, and I've certainly done versions of the third. Um, I don't know which I'll end up doing next. Um, 
maybe there won't be a next. Maybe this job will morph from one into another. Um, I really couldn't tell you at the moment. Um, but I know that the main, the main joy lies in the third. You know, being in a good enough place with good colleagues, uh, doing God's work. And, you know, I'm, it's, I'm hugely privileged to be trusted to be doing that now. Whether I do that here or somewhere else, I hope I still feel it's God's work. And I feel that I've got something to bring to it. And I'm learning from my colleagues and the situations that arise. I don't have a, you know, I, I'm not a Michael Heseltine who's written how to be prime minister on the back of an envelope when I'm 25. Um, it doesn't have to be called a specific thing. It just has to be those things. You just have to be, you know, if you're in the Acts of the Apostles, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, Timothy or somebody who, who just gets a one line mention or you're Paul who half the book's about. You're in the Acts of the Apostles. That's pretty good. <laughs> you know, that's a big deal. The Acts of the Apostles doesn't get much bigger than that. Apart from the Gospels, maybe. Um, depending on your theology. Uh, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I feel I'm in the Acts of the Apostles. I'm, 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 that's fantastic. Um, I don't have to be Paul. You know, he probably didn't enjoy it half the time. Um, but one of those, you know, Phoebe or so, I know she's Romans, but you know what I mean? But it, it, it doesn't really matter so long as you're doing gospel work. And, and if you can be in a place which is creative and you're learning something and you feel that other people are growing, that's the icing on the cake. You know, that's, that's great stuff. Um, so it's not a very simple answer, but it's the truth. It's a stunning answer. It's wonderful. What a wonderful, wonderful place for us to finish. What has been a great privilege. Thank you uh, for the time that you've given today and for your openness and vulnerability, which models everything I have read in the few of your books that I have read. There are many of them in your canon. Uh, thank you for your investment as a priest and an academic and how that has worked out day to day. You've inspired me and I think this interview will be inspiring for many people. So, uh, so Sam Wells, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed that and we have many other interviews with amazing guests where we listen attentively and respectfully to discover people's backstories through their beliefs and life experiences and find out what shaped them into who they are and inspires what they do. You can catch all those interviews by liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can find audio versions in your podcast platform of choice, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, etc. Just search Extra ECC. Of course, you can go to extraecc.com and sign up for our newsletter and find all our social media links and more. And by the way, all links are in our show notes below. Mm -hmm.